Time for you to rethink. You know the word annihilate? It means reduced to nothing. Perished means killed. We know what perished means. Welcome, and thanks for joining us for Rethinking Hell Live, where evangelical Christians discuss what the Bible says about hell and put conventional and controversial views to the test. Join the discussion in YouTube's live chat or email your feedback, questions, and episode suggestions to live at rethinkinghell.com. Rethinking Hell is on Facebook as well, and be sure to check us out on Patreon if you'd like to become a supporter of the show. See the description below for all links and details, and don't forget to subscribe to this channel for future updates. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Rethinking Hell Live. My name is Chris Date, and if you're not familiar with us here at Rethinking Hell, we are uh, conservative evangelical Christians committed to the authority and inspiration and, and infallibility of the um, Bible, and we become convinced that the Bible does not teach the traditional doctrine of hell as eternal conscious torment, but rather teaches the doctrine of conditional immortality or annihilationism. Those of you not familiar with this view, it's very, it's quite simple, and it's best to contrast it with the traditional view of hell, according to which all humankind will one day rise from their graves, be resurrected bodily, and according to the traditional view, both the saved and the lost will be made immortal when they are raised from the dead, physically immortal, and capable of living physically forever, either in the good place or the bad pay place, as it were. By contrast, we at Rethinking Hell believe the Bible teaches that only the saved, when they are resurrected, will be made physically immortal. The lost will instead rise, still mortal, to be judged and sentenced to death. And they, they will at that point be executed, uh, killed, and if their, if their immaterial souls go on consciously existing after the first death, Jesus says that it will uh, die the same death with the body in the second death. He says that in Matthew 10, 28. Much more could be said if you want to learn more about what we think here at Rethinking Hell and why. Do check out the previous episodes of Rethinking Hell Live. You can also check out RethinkingHell.com and the blog articles that we have there. Uh, there's a Rethinking Hell podcast, which you can find at that website or on iTunes. And episodes four and seven in particular will give you a good introduction to our view if you're not familiar with it. Or even if you think you're familiar with it, but perhaps you've heard of it from uh, apologists for the traditional view, in which case you might have some misunderstandings. So anyway, uh, just a quick reminder, um, if after this video is over, you've enjoyed what you'd watch, we would be absolutely grateful if you would click that uh, like, that thumbs up button on YouTube, and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already, if you would like to keep abreast with uh, the videos that we put out, which include not only Rethinking Hell live episodes, but also recordings from our annual conferences and much more. Also, please do uh, consider making a one-time or recurring donation. We are in entirely donation funded. We don't have a store. We don't uh, make room for advertisers or anything like that. Uh, and we can definitely use your financial help. So if that's something you're considering doing, please go to rethinkinghell.com and click on the PayPal button. Uh, or if you like to use Patreon, go to patreon.com slash rethinkinghell. And in the not too distant future, we'll have some uh, perks available for our Patreon patrons. We don't yet, but uh, we, we are getting there. Um, in fact, I'll, I'll just give a little bit of a teaser. At our very first conference, uh, we we showed some um, correspondence, some handwritten correspondence between Edward Fudge, author of The Fire That Consumes, and some of his theological heroes. And uh, we might even be able to share some digital images of those to our Patreon uh, patrons in the not-too-distant future, if that's something you might be interested in. And of course, we'll we'll make much more available as well. Uh, and let's see here. One of the things that that your donations help us to be able to do is those annual conferences. We've had six of them so far from every year from 2014 to 2019, and we're having our seventh annual conference uh, this year in November. Uh, and if you want to learn more about the details, you can go to rethinkinghellconference.com. And you can see that the theme of this year's conference is apologetics and the problem of hell. And because of the 
uh, person that we're going to be responding to in Rethinking Hell Live today. Uh, the theme of this conference as apologetics and the problem of hell will be particularly um, relevant. Uh, so if you are here to watch this episode because you enjoy apologetics, uh, then you might enjoy this conference. So go to RethinkingHellConference.com. You can see our speakers here, Paul Copan, uh, Clay Jones, Tim Barnett, and myself. All three of those people to my left on the screen. Uh, thanks for the compliments, by the way, Ben, in chat. I appreciate the, uh, the mention. By the way, you might not notice this, but it's not only a haircut that makes me look a little bit different. I haven't, I've been private about this. I haven't mentioned this because I was hoping to wait a little bit longer and make it something of a surprise. But um, in the past six weeks, uh, I have lost nearly 30 pounds while building muscle. I'm hoping to uh, be much more fit and trim at this year's conference than I have been at all the previous ones. We'll see if I'm able to maintain this trajectory until then. So maybe what you're seeing, Ben, is not just my haircut, but also my thinner face. At least that's what I'd like to tell myself. Anyway, all three of the speakers on the screen here to my left, Paul Copan, Clay Jones, and Tim Barnett, are all believers in eternal torment. I'm the only one who believes otherwise. As you can see, we have our conferences for all people, all believers, people who believe in all the various views of hell at our conferences. We think this is truly a dialogue to be had between representatives of all three views. Uh, tickets are available, and for another two weeks, this super early bird ticket for just 25 bucks will continue to be available available at which point the price will go up to 37.50 so you've still got two more weeks to take advantage of that super low price and also if you can't make it to the seattle area in november then you can purchase a virtual uh, online streaming ticket you can see here for just five bucks ten percent of the cost of standard admission so um even if you can't make it in person attend live it's, it's going to be pretty uh pretty incredible stuff i think so uh that's the kind of thing, among many other things, that your donations help us to do, and I'd appreciate you um, considering donating and helping us to continue our ministry. Now, what am I going to be doing today? Today, I'm going to be responding primarily to a video um, put out by Brett Kunkel in May of 2015, as you can see here from the timestamp uh, right here. Uh, and, and by the way, at the time, Brett Kunkel was part of the ministry Stand to Reason, um, which makes this uh, this year's conference doubly relevant to the, today's episode of Rethinking Hell Live, because uh, although Brett Kunkel is no longer with Stand to Reason, Tim Barnett is with Stand to Reason. Um, and so, Tim, I hope that you'll watch this and uh, maybe give your former teammate a bit of a hard time for making such a bad philosophical argument against annihilationism as he here purports to do. Again, this was in May of 2015. And what's interesting is that this was two years uh, almost, actually more than two years after I had published at Rethinking Hell, this article in which I respond to J.P. Moreland, um, as it turns out, on the exact same argument. So what I'm going to be doing today is playing this video by Brett Kunkel and making a couple of preliminary uh, remarks along the way. And then when it's over, I will uh, rebut Brett Kunkel's argument uh, and explain why I think it fails and why I actually think that the matter of sanctity of life lends itself quite well to conditional immortality and to annihilationism. So without further ado, let's go ahead and jump right into the video. And as I said, I will uh, pause along the way and make some um, passing remarks before I really dig in and start my rebuttal. Here we go. There's a growing movement to extinguish hell, or uh, at least the traditional concept of hell, uh, and it's called uh, annihilationism. Now, there are, I think, biblical arguments against annihilationism. I don't find annihilationism compelling, uh, and I, I think the, the biblical text indicates that, uh, unfortunately, hell is eternal conscious uh, torment. But, but let's set aside the biblical case for a second. I want to actually offer another argument against annihilationism, and it would be a philosophical argument. And it would actually parallel our case for uh, the pro-life position. So we believe the unborn is a intrinsically valuable human being. And because this unborn child is a human being with inherent worth, we say that it's, it's wrong to kill that being uh, for some reason like quality of life, right? 
Now, let me pause right there uh, and, and make one of those preliminary remarks that I said a moment ago that I would offer. Uh, I actually think this is a really important point. Uh, the reason why so many of us evangelicals, those of us who hold to a consistent application of our worldview, um, we believe that uh, abortion is uh, wrong, morally wrong, for in part, at least, the very reason that Brett just mentioned, which is that there's inherent sanctity of life. There's inherent value value, inherent goodness in being alive as a human being. Uh, now, we might, there are going to be a smaller number, I suppose, of Christians who are opposed to euthanasia, but I'm opposed to it as well, uh, for in part the same reason. This is all very true, but now consider, before we get to um, the rest of Brett's argument, consider that in the traditional view of hell, very often, its its defenders are going to tell you that hell is separation from God and all of and all goodness, all good things. It's it's the withholding of all good things. In fact, in one of my debates, one of my very first debates, my my opponent who believed in eternal torment and still does, uh, made that very claim that hell is a place where all good things are withheld from the lost. But. Remember, the doctrine of eternal torment maintains that the lost are going to be risen from the dead, raised from the dead bodily, made physically immortal, and live physically forever in torment. If life, if, if having life is inherently good, then according to Brett's traditional view of hell, uh, all human beings that go to hell will forever have this good thing that is life. Only the doctrine of conditional immortality and annihilationism, according to which the finally impenitent are executed and never live or experience anything ever again, is all goodness withheld from the lost. And this is why, much to the shock and chagrin of some of my fellow conditionalists, I actually think that annihilation is a more severe penalty, an objectively more severe penalty than eternal torment because in our view all good things including life itself are withheld from the wicked in hell and by contrast brett's view is that the good thing that is life the innately good thing that is human life is something that god guarantees that the risen lost have forever um now that's just a passing thing. I'm not making an argument for conditionalism here, but for those of you fellow conditionalists, anytime a traditionalist tells you that you're downplaying um, the severity of sin, the seriousness of sin, you go ahead and tell them, yeah, but you might think so, but in your view, uh, God doesn't withhold life from the wicked, uh, but God, in our view, takes sin so seriously, he even withholds life itself from the wicked. So uh, to whatever extent you find that useful and, and helpful, uh, I offer it to you. Let's continue to hear what Brett has to say. Right, so if a child, an unborn child, is going to be born into poverty, uh, we don't say, though, that gives us justification to kill the child, right? Because there's inherent worth and dignity in that child, and a low quality of life doesn't give us justification to kill the unborn child. Well, I think there's a parallel here with annihilationism. All right, this is the view that God is going to, uh, uh, after death, extinguish the, the person who is unrighteous. So they will go out of existence. They'll be, be gone forever. They will have no ontological status. Well, uh, here would be my philosophical argument against that view. If human beings are intrinsically valuable, we are made in the image of God, then someone's low quality of existence being uh, in eternal conscious torment in hell is not justification for God to extinguish their existence. So consider a couple of things here again preliminarily before I get into my fuller rebuttal. All right. Firstly, notice that he said a low quality of existence. You know, very often we conditionalists are accused of treating life and existence as if they're synonymous. But it's actually traditionalists like Brett who do that because he doesn't only believe that the wicked in hell will exist there. Um, if he did believe that, then he could believe that the wicked are disembodied souls in hell for eternity. But he doesn't. Like the rest of the staff at Stand to Reason, and like traditionalists since at least the time of uh, Tatian and Athenagoras in the second century, those who believe in eternal torment believe the risen lost are embodied and alive and immortal, physically speaking. 
So it's not, it's actually Brett and other traditionalists who, in order to um, avoid the powerful biblical case that hell is a place where the wicked are, where life is withheld from the wicked, they have to play games with the language of life and existence and treat them, you know, don't speak of life, but rather speak of existence in order to avoid that, the, the implications of that biblical data. Um, I don't want to let traditionalists do that. And my fellow conditionalists, I would encourage you to do the same. Anytime you're told that the wicked just exist in hell, they don't live there, you point out they're the ones that are equivocating with the words life and existence. Uh, no, they believe the wicked will be alive physically forever in hell. Secondly, notice that he appealed to the uh, biblical doctrine of being created in the image of God, um, saying that God wouldn't extinguish somebody created in the image of God or whatever. Uh, but notice that the only place, and, and I encourage you to go do this research for yourself, go look at everywhere where humankind is said to be created in the image of God and find out if, and see which, if any, of those texts connect humankind's bearing the imago dei, being you know created and bear created with created to bear the image of god anywhere where that is connected to human mortality or immortality you will only find one only one and it's this one in genesis chapter 9 verses 5 and 6 and for your lifeblood i will require a reckoning from every beast i will require it and from man from his fellow man i will require a reckoning for the li for the life of man whoever sheds the blood of man by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. You see, to bear the image of God does not make you immortal, and it does not make it um, impossible for you to be killed, or even wrong to be killed. Quite the contrary. God is here saying that it's the fact that human beings are created in the image of God that means that somebody who unjustly kills another of God's image bearers must himself be killed. That's what it means to be created in the image of God. It means having this moral responsibility, the violation of which warrants the death penalty. Bearing the image of God means it can be just to kill you. Or in part, that's what, that's what the image of God means. So appealing to the language of the image of God isn't going to help Brett here. And the third thing that I just wanted to point out is that what Brett has here said, and you're going to hear him say it again, um, and this is critical to the argument. He has, he has implied here that the reason why God might annihilate the lost in hell is in order to prevent them from experiencing a low quality of life. And if that were true, if that's why God would kill a finally lost, is, is to prevent them from experiencing a low quality of life, then Brett's argument might have some merit. All right. But if there are uh, if there are some other reasons why, why God would finally annihilate the lost, the argument might not hold. And as we'll see, it does not hold. But let's let him continue. Just, so just to reiterate, what he said here is that it's unjust, it, 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 it violates the sanctity of life to, you, to do something with human beings that treats them as a means to an end. And he said that annihilation portrays God treating humans as a means to an end because they, by killing them, he prevents a certain end from happening. Namely, that they experience conscious torment for eternity. And you'll hear him... Uh, expand on the argument a little bit more so that you know that I'm not uh, mischaracterizing him. Let, let's hear him continue before I get to my rebuttal. And so I think this is uh, uh, this this would be treating human beings as a uh, means to an end rather than an end in themselves. Human beings are intrinsically valuable and therefore it doesn't seem to me that that would be consistent with God extinguishing them. Now God has dignified us and he's dignified us with human freedom such that he, is the res he, he respects that, and he respects our choices, and he respects the inherent worth that we have as human beings, that I don't think it would be justified uh, to, to think that he would then extinguish human beings made in his image because of a low quality ex uh, of existence. And I think that would be one uh, philosophical argument against the annihilationist position. So there you heard Brett say it, um, that it would be unjust for God to 
kill the wicked in hell to extinguish them in order in order to prevent them from experiencing a low quality of life. That's the argument. But before I get into my rebuttal, let me just point out again what this passage in Genesis 9 says about bearing the image of God. Yes, God respects our human freedom. Uh, and I say that as a Calvinist who believes that human freedom is not the same thing as the human freedom that Brett thinks we enjoy. But we can put that aside and we can just say, yes, God respects the con whatever kind of human freedom he has given human beings. But what does it mean, according to this passage, for God to respect the freedom with which a person might uh, choose to do something sinful like murder someone. Well, according to this text, somebody who uses his freedom or her freedom in that way deserves to be executed. Now that is a hint. It, it's, it's sort of a transition into my rebuttal. Because again, what Brett has here argued is that the the only reason, or at least at the very at the very least, he's implied that the only reason God might annihilate the lost in hell is to avoid their experiencing a low quality of life in the same way that somebody might say euthanasia is a good thing in order to prevent them from experiencing a low quality of life. But what does this text in Genesis 9 offer as the reason why God might demand somebody be executed? Justice. Justice. And that's what I want to um, that's what I want to focus on here in my rebuttal. And by way of reminder, um, Brett's article, his, his video came out in 2015, over two years after I had published this article responding to the exact same argument by J.P. Moreland. In fact, if I were a betting man, uh, I would bet that Brett simply parroted or regurgitated this argument directly from J.P. Moreland. Um, here you can see the title of the article, and you can look this up by just doing a Google search for Rethinking Hell, J.P. Moreland, or Rethinking Hell, Sanctity of Life, or something along those lines. The title of the article I wrote is Intrinsic Value, Sanctity of Life, and Capital Punishment, a response to J.P. Moreland. Um, now, I'm not going to go through this whole article. I'd rather you read it so that you can get the fuller treatment of my rebuttal. But look at what... Um, what J.P. Moreland is quoted as saying in Lee Strobel's The Case for Christ. Uh, and this I will read out. This is what J.P. Moreland argues. Believe it or not, everlasting separation from God is morally superior to annihilation. Why would God be morally justified in annihilating somebody? The only way... Are you starting to see here the parallels to Brett's video? The only way, Moreland says, that it would be a good thing for God to annihilate somebody would be the end result, which would be to keep people from experiencing the conscious separation from God forever. Well, then you're treating people as a means to an end. It's like forcing people to go to heaven. What you're saying is the thing that really matters is that people no longer suffer, suffer consciously, so I'm going to snuff this person out of existence in order to achieve that end. Do you see? That's treating the person as a means to an end. You can see why I'm willing to make that bet if I were pressed? That Brett is just repeating J.P. Moreland's argument? Now, sure, it's possible that two philosophers or one professional philosopher and a professional apologist happened to came up with an identical argument two years apart. Well, actually, no, my article is responding to something a few years even earlier than that. So is it possible that this philosopher and this apologist came up with the exact same argument a mere five, six, seven years apart? Sure, that's possible. I don't think it's likely, though. So um, Notice, though, just to reiterate, the key to this argument against our view is the implication in Brett's video and the explicit statement by Moreland that the only way it would be just for or good for God to annihilate the lost in hell would be to prevent them from experiencing a low quality of life. But as we just saw in the biblical text, in just one passage out of numerous, the wages of sin is death, Romans 6.23, Romans 1, those who deserve such things know they deserve, or those who do such things know they deserve to die, John 3.16, God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life on and on and on and on it goes the bible consistently and repeatedly and in no uncertain terms uh, and in a variety of ways makes death the just penalty for sin and that's going to be the crux of my argument but what i do want to 
say just uh, briefly is that arguably the exact same argument could be leveled against Moreland's and Kunkel's own view. Um, what would the reason be for God to separate the lost consciously forever from himself and thereby cause them to experience some sort of low quality of life? Uh, well, it would be so that justice is done. Right, so that so that or whatever, if that's just treating somebody as a means to an end, then the exact same thing is true of Moreland's view and Kunkel's view, right? If 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 uh, if if they are kept alive forever in hell, so that justice is done, and if that's treating them as a means to an end, the end being that justice has been done, then the exact same argument would work against J.P. Moreland's and Brett Kunkel's view. Um, in fact. <laughs> argue and, and this is just a little even more of a side note but in their view justice is never done never for all eternity there is still an eternity of punishment to be meted out and experienced consciously by the wicked in hell but in conditionalism justice is fully wrought on the day of judgment when the wicked are finally executed um, there's ne once they're dead, there's never any longer any point in time where justice remains to be done. So I think that's worth noting. But again, um, the crux of my response to this argument, and this frankly and indisputably uh, refutes the argument and shows it to be a pretty bad argument, is that there's another reason why God might annihilate the wicked. And that is because that's what justice requires. As we saw from Genesis 9, that's what the justice of God demands for somebody who commits a capital offense. They deserve to be killed. He's not treating them as a means to an end to doing that. In fact, quite the contrary, as we're about to see, as J.P. Moreland himself argues, doing that uh, by, by executing somebody who has exercised the freedom to commit a crime worthy of death, to give them that death is to uphold, not contravene, their sanctity of life. So let's let let me keep going through this. Um, uh, and I point out in this article again, you can go read it if you want the, the the more the fuller treatment. But he makes a similar argument, but slightly different in the Apologetic Study Bible, which is edited by Paul Copan. Oh, there's another uh, uh, person who's going to be one of these speakers at this year's conference. But what I want to point out um, is that in another book. This one, co-authored with Norman Geisler, another well-known apologist, uh, the name of the book is The Life and Death Debate, colon, Moral Issues of Our Time. It was published by Prager in 1990. And um, remember, my rebuttal hinges on the notion that it is justice uh, for which God finally annihilates the lost. And I've argued that by meeting out the death penalty to those people who have merited it, he is actually upholding their sanctity of life, not diminishing it. Now, somebody might respond, as Brett appears to do, well, God wouldn't do that to an image bearer. That would be that would be to fail to uphold the sanctity of life, right? Well, now he's parting ways from J.P. Moreland, because look what J.P. Moreland writes in uh, with Norman Geisler in The Life and Death Debate, Moral Issues of Our Time. Here, I'm going to quote again. John Locke argued that even a person's natural and inalienable right to life can be forfeited under some circumstances. And it is forfeited whenever a person violates the right to life of another. Locke insisted that the offender, by violating the life, liberty, or property of another, has lost his own right to have life, liberty, or property respected. Sir William Blackstone, in his influential commentary on the laws of England, carried over the principle of forfeiture into Anglo-American criminal law. One way... J.P. Moreland continues, one way the basic principle is justified is to note that even absolute rights can be preempted. Moral duties are only prima facie. They stand only until challenged by something greater, like the law of justice. You see, in, in fact, let me keep reading a little bit more from this book. Um, Moreland and Geisler go on to say um, that punishing persons for their wrong, and, and by the way, this is under a heading in their book where, where the heading is capital punishment is pro-human. According to some, they write, punishing persons for their wrong is a compliment, not an insult to their freedom and dignity. 
Because to be in the here, he quotes, he, he positively or approvingly quotes C.S. Lewis to be punished, however severely, because we deserved it, uh, is to be treated as a human person. To do anything less is to reduce human dignity, to treat person like a thing. Capital punishment, then, is the ultimate complement to human dignity. And on and on, my article goes for a little bit longer. Um, so here's the point that I'm getting at. And all I'm doing is really quoting J.P. Moreland against himself and against Brett after having quoted the Bible against them. The argument is by both J.P. Moreland and Brett Kunkel. The argument is apparently for some reason that I can't understand. These two people thought or think that the only reason God might finally execute the wicked in hell is to uh, to you treat them as a means to an end by uh, prevent it, by killing them in order to prevent them from experiencing a poor quality of life. But all I need to do is offer one alternative reason why God might annihilate the lost uh, that doesn't fall under the same challenge, which is justice that sin merits the death penalty, as scripture itself, as I've demonstrated, testifies to. And furthermore, I've cited J.P. Moreland himself as uh, arguing that capital punishment, far from diminishing sanctity of life or failing to uphold sanctity of life, it actually maximizes, magnifies the sanctity of life, the sanctity of human life. Because what it does is it allows human beings to exercise the freedom God has given them to do something that merits death. When you are treated, when you are shown, when you were, when you are shown the justice that your free choice, that you freely chose to do, uh, merits, that upholds your sanctity of life. It upholds the dignity of life rather than works against it. So, the whole argument collapses. Not only the argument as Brett makes it. But the further argument that he could, that he sort of implied, which is God wouldn't kill his own image bearer. No, quite the contrary. He will kill his image bearer because it's that's what it means to, 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 to treat them with dignity and sanctity is to do to them what their free choices deserve, what, what they've chosen to merit by doing what they've done. So in every imaginable way. Uh, in terms of what it means to be created in the image of God, in terms of why God might kill the finally lost in hell, in terms of whether or not capital punishment upholds or fails to uphold the dignity of life. In every imaginable way, both explicit and implicit, Brett's and J.P. Moreland's arguments here fail badly. This is the kind of thing, honestly, that would get you a failing grade in an introduction to philosophy class. Because notice, you know, one of the things about philosophy is that it treats you to, it teaches you to think very logically, to, to take what are unstated distinctions between premises and conclusions in an argument and map them out so that you can really evaluate them with a level of precision that you wouldn't otherwise be able to do. And, and what both J.P. Moreland and Brett Kunkel are doing is assuming and stating, as a matter of fact, without any justification, not even not even no justification, but not even an attempt to justify, is their assumption that the only reason God might finally kill the lost in hell is to prevent them from experiencing a low quality of life. Where do they get that assumption? Not only, They just state it, and they don't even attempt to justify it, let alone successfully do so. And that's why I say this is just inherently and objectively an extremely bad philosophical argument that would get a failing grade or at the very least uh, a low grade in a philosophy class because they're, they're smuggling into the argument unstated assumptions and sometimes stated assumptions without any sort of um, justification even attempted. So, Brett, I love you. I'm a big fan of both Stand to Reason, for which you previously worked, um, and I'm a big fan of uh, your desire to uh, help the church do better youth ministry. I even are, I even interviewed you on, you on my own personal podcast several years ago before I stopped doing it um, on that very topic. And J.P. Moreland, in the unlikely event that you watch this, I'm also a fan of yours. Just a few months ago, I was at the National ETS meeting, and I saw you give an excellent um, uh, presentation, a plenary speed, a presentation on how biblical theology theologians can benefit from philosophers in doing apologetics. You guys, Brett and JP, you both do fantastic work. But you, this argument that you both have made is not a good argument in any possible, conceivable measure. It's just a really bad argument. So I would, I, I would encourage you to um, 
reconsider that argument. Now, I'm not saying that you have to embrace my view, that, that somehow, because this is a bad argument, therefore my view wins. I'm not saying that, obviously. But I am saying, don't publish chapters and books and videos on, on um, websites that are demonstrably b failing grade type philosophical arguments. It's, it's, it's a bad idea. So I hope that's been helpful to you. This has been a short, much shorter response than previous because it's a short argument to respond to. But um, keep that in mind. Anytime you hear somebody say God would be treating people as means to an end by annihilating them in hell, now you know why they're saying that. It's because they're assuming, without any attempted justification, that the only reason God might do so is to prevent them from experiencing a low quality of life. And all I got to do is say, no, he, that's not the reason he does it. He does it because that's what, the, what sin merits, is death. The wages of sin is death. Um, and... As, and then, and if and if and you could point out that even J.P. Moreland, the person who evidently coined this argument, uh, it himself argues against himself because he points out that capital punishment upholds human dignity rather than works against it. So hopefully that's been helpful to you. And at this point, if you want to go, if 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 that's all you came for, you can leave. Although I would encourage you to please, once again, check out the RethinkingHellConference.com website. Um, so that you can uh, possibly sign up for an in-person or uh, online ticket. And for those of you who want to stick around just a little bit longer, I'm going to scroll through the YouTube chat and respond to some of the things in there since I didn't get to during the course of my response. So um, let's see here. Somebody asked if there are Rethinking Hell t-shirts. We, at one very, very early on in the ministry, did make a couple of t-shirts. We have not reprinted any. Um, uh, I think that it would be a cool idea to have some Rethinking Hell memorabilia, uh, and I will talk to the team about possibly doing something like that. Um, I know a lot, there have been conferences at which we've passed out stickers that you can put on bumpers of cars and things, and I think that and t-shirts and mugs and bookmarks and stuff like that are excellent ways to start conversations about hell. Um, there have been a number of times when I've had... Uh, uh, I, I've been to conferences, not Rethinking Hell conferences, but other conferences where I wore my Rethinking Hell t-shirt the one year that I had it, and, and it triggered conversations, and it's a great opportunity to uh, open people's eyes to the reality that there are other ways of thinking about hell that are faithful to scripture. Um, let's see, what else here? Uh, <clears throat> So the Idle Babbler, the Daily Dose, says, please make these weekly live chats available as podcasts. Uh, yes, I will do that. Uh, the, the, the reason why I've, I've drugged my feet is because I would... There's so much to these Rethinking Hell live, live streams that is, that is visual. Um, now, I'm not saying they'd be totally useless or even mostly useless if it was just audio, but that is a concern I have. And so my... my Ideal thought has been to make it a vidcast. I, I'm pretty sure you can use podcatchers, uh, iTunes and other things to subscribe to podcasts that aren't audio only, but are actually video as well. But I don't know how to do that. So that's something I'm looking into. And I also am looking into whether or not we should just go ahead and make it audio. Because I think the reason why people want it to be made in podcast form is so they can download it beforehand and listen to it while they're driving. Well, having it be in video form isn't going to help them unless they're dumb and watch videos while they're driving. Uh, something of which I've been guilty at times. Um, so, uh, but, but on the other hand, again, there might be people who you know, want to download it beforehand so they can watch it, you know, uh, during a break between classes or something like that, in which case they'd actually want to see it. So I've just got some issues. We, as a team, we've got some things to work out as far as how to make this into a podcast, but but we will get around to it. Um, let's see. If God destroys them, why the threat of hell or hellfire? Why not just say if you sin, then destruction or annihilation? Just wondering. Uh, well, first of all, I think the language of hell and hellfire is the language of destruction or annihilation. You know, when, when Jesus says, when he uses the word Gehenna, he's using a Greek New Testament um, uh, shortening and transliteration of a Hebrew Old Testament phrase, the Valley of the Sons of Hinnom. And in places like Jeremiah 7.33, God prophesies that that valley will one day be called the Valley of Slaughter uh, because God's enemies will be slain and their dead bodies will be strewn about the ground and scavenging beasts and birds won't be frightened away and will completely consume those corpses. So by using the word Gehenna, which is where hell comes from, he is using uh, the language of destruction and annihilation. Uh, we could also point out that when Jude uses the language of, of eternal fire, he's using that language to describe the fire 
fire that came down from he heaven and destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. And he says this is an example of what awaits the finally ungodly. Um, he is telling you that if you want to know what final punishment looks like, look at the fire that came down from uh, heaven and destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. He's, he's telling you it's death, it's destruction, whether or not he actually means to say that fire is part of it. Um, and finally, maybe that will be brought about by, by fire from heaven. Um, there are plenty of examples, uh, not, not just including Sodom and Gomorrah, but others as well, where divine fire is what kills people. And it may be what the, what kills the finally lost. So, uh, yeah, uh, I hope that answers your question, Frank. Um, let's see. Uh, no, Nothoff in the YouTube chat says hellfire isn't a technical term used the Bible actually it kind of is uh, in Matthew 18, 8 and 9 I think it is he uses the phrase Gehenna of fire uh, which is uh, basically hell of fire or hellfire um, but again he's using it to refer to annihilation now Frank you say, I think Chris Date believes that the wicked do suffer in hell for a time and then they're destroyed no, that's not exactly accurate um, the only sense in which I think the wicked will suffer in hell and then are destroyed is the sense in which the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah suffered in fire and then died. Or the sense in which a, uh, a, a, a mass murderer suffers on the electric chair and then dies. But of course, the suffering that the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah experienced in fire was not something separate from their death. Right? They weren't burned in fire and burned in fire and burned in fire and they suffered and suffered and suffered until finally they paid what they owe and then they die. No. Their death was brought about by painful means. And the same is true of the electric chair, the, the, the hangman's noose, lethal injection, the gas chamber, the firing squad. Every form of capital punishment inflicts pain to one degree or another. Even lethal injection, scientists are increasingly think there's some, there's some degree of pain experienced. But that pain isn't separable from the death. The pain is what is experienced as part of, by, by the means by which death is inflicted. And that's my view. So I don't think that they'll suffer for a period of time in hell and then die. I think they will suffer as part of the process by which they are killed. Now that might seem like a fine line, a fine distinction, but it is a distinction nevertheless. And it also upholds the fact that the punishment prescribed by the Bible for sin is not torment, it's, it's death. The, 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 the hangman's noose, the, cap, the electric chair, lethal injection, all of these and other forms of capital punishment, they all inflict the same punishment, which is death. But they're also all painful. That's my view. All right. Um, Let's see here. Uh, Frank asks, what sounds worse, death or eternal torment in hell? That depends on who, whom you ask. If you asked um, the first century Greek historian Plutarch, he would tell you that he and his Greek countrymen believed eternal torment was better than, um, than being annihilated, than dying and being annihilated. Uh, a couple hundred years later, Augustine, a believer in eternal torment, said that if you were to give a sinner the choice between being kept alive forever in torment or being annihilated, they would instantaneously and joyfully embrace and accept eternal torment. Now, you might, Frank, and many others might think, well, that sounds bizarre. Fine, but I don't. I actually think that's true. I'm much more afraid of, say, dying and never experiencing anything ever again than I am being in a prison, set in, prison cell by myself forever. Now, you might disagree. Fine. Uh, but the point is that question is a subjective question. Which one is more fearful? But again, going back to how I started my response to Brett Kunkel, I would argue that from an objective standpoint, uh, annihilation is more severe because even the goodness of life itself is withheld from you. Uh, let's see here. Uh, <laughs> Peter says this is a low quality of argument, referring to um, Brett Kunkel's and JP, JP Moreland's arguments. And yeah, that's right. Uh, you know what? I accidentally scrolled down too far. Let's see here. Um, Let's see. Um, somebody asks about the lake of fire. Okay, the lake of fire is interesting. First of all, the lake of fire isn't a prophecy in the sense that John is not predicting that there will one day be a lake of fire on earth or somewhere other than earth and that the wicked are going to be suffering in it forever. No, what he's doing is he's seeing a symbolic vision, an apocalyptic symbolic vision featuring a lake of fire 
in which the wicked are depicted suffering forever in the lake of fire. The devil, the beast, and the false prophet uh, are depicted that way, and then death and Hades and the wicked are thrown into it as well, presumably to face the same fate. But it's interpreted as meaning the second death. And when biblical figures interpret apocalyptic imagery, going all the way back to Joseph in prison, when he interpreted the Pharaoh's cupbearers and baker's dreams, and when he interpreted the Pharaoh's dreams itself, um, when they tell you that something in the imagery is this in reality, the this in reality part's just plain straightforward language. And second death both just plain straightforwardly means dying a second time, and moreover, it's a phrase that pre-existed John's use of it in the book of Revelation. Uh, it was used several times in the Targums, which were Aramaic translations of the Hebrew Old Testament into, well, again, and into Aramaic. And second death in all of that literature means uh, dying a second time in the world to come and never living again. So... Um, the lake of fire is, you, you can't press that image into service. You need to ask what the interpretation of it is, and there it's death, ordinarily speaking. Now, we could ask ourselves why a lake of fire, and that's a really good question, and I don't have a good answer to it, but I have been recently exploring an intriguing connection. Interestingly, a lake of fire and second death are both languages, you know, phrases and, and, and concepts that occur together in one other body of literature, and that's ancient Egyptian literature, um, where the lake of fire was a place where the, and, and where, and what the, where the second death is the final annihilation of, um, people. And so it's conceivable, and, and there are uh, a number of scholars that have argued that there are uh, connections uh, in the book of Revelation to even some of that Egyptian folklore, that Egyptian literature, or whatever, even if its primary wellspring is the Hebrew Old Testament. So maybe he's using Lake of Fire because it was already in some of his readers' minds associated with the kind of second death that he intends to communicate here. So he's, so he's, he's not only using second death in plain, straightforward language, just, you know, just to make sure you get the point. But he's also appealing to a common concept in the Jewish intertestamental literature, the Targums, where second death means what he wants you to, wants you to understand it means. And I'm, I'm suggesting that possibly he's also using this picture of Lake of Fire because some of his readers will understand that as a reference to that same kind of thing. He's stacking on all these possible, uh, every possible way he's trying to get you to realize he's talking about death as ordinarily understood, not some sort of on going um, immortality and life in, in hell. So that's a connection worth exploring. If there are any of you budding scholars who want to explore the possibility that perhaps there's an Egyptian connection in the book of Revelation, that might be something worth doing. Uh, let's see here. Um, okay, Frank asks, in Mark 9.43, Jesus... Okay, I'm, I'm not going to read the King James here. I, I don't think that's a good translation. So let me look up Mark 9.43 in the ESV. If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell to the unquenchable fire. And Frank asks, it is better for the... If, or uh, if he will die in hell, why cut your hand off? So that you don't die! Right? That's the point Jesus is making. It's better to cut your hand off and keep living than to be thrown entirely, whole body, into hell and die. That's why, that's why if you die in hell, it's better instead to cut your hand off so you don't go there and die. Now, of course, nobody actually thinks that people will be handless or eyeless in, in eternity in, in heaven uh, because he's, he's speaking hyperbolically. But the point is, is that he's saying the alternative to even, even dismembered life is death. Uh, and I think that's evidence for our view, not a challenge to it. Oh, and then I see Frank says, dumb question. I take that one back, lol. Okay, Frank, sorry about that. I, I didn't look far enough ahead. Um, let's see here. Uh, ch -ch 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 um, uh, Susan asks, what about the time it takes to go before the judgment? Wouldn't that be a bad experience if you knew the outcome, the death penalty? Well, I mean, there, there's that too. Uh, Kim Papaiwano, the author of The Geography of Hell, I think that's what he, what he calls it, um, uh, the, the, uh, is it called The Geography of Hell? I think it's called The Geography of Hell. And in that book, he argues that this language of weeping and gnashing of teeth is language used to describe the remorse and the anger that people experience when they are finally, when they finally realize and it is revealed to them that they are being excluded from God's kingdom. And God's kingdom is the only kingdom in which there will be life. And God's kingdom will fill the whole universe. Um, so there, 
weeping and gnashing is is a is an our emotional responses to the realization that they won't be participating in life and in God's kingdom. Um, and so yes, Susan, it would be a bad experience to be judged knowing you're about to be excluded from life forever. And then of course, it'll be a painful experience being killed uh, all all the way up until the moment they breathe their last. Um do, 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 do. Oh, and I see Ben even mentioned the weeping and gnashing their teeth there in response to Susan. So Ben, Ben's got a good head on his shoulders. Uh, let's see. James Henry asks, how did I lose almost 30 pounds in the past six weeks? Really simple. It's just making better choices. So I am no longer, I used to eat right up until moments before going to bed. Um, especially very sugary things. I love sugary cereal and I was eating that moments before bed sometimes. I'm no longer eating less than two hours before bed. Uh, I'm drinking at least 64 ounces of water every day. I'm still drinking a lot of diet soda, but I've cut back in order to make room for more water. Uh, I am carefully counting the uh, nutritional contents of what I eat every day. Um, I'm avoiding, for the most part, sugar, uh, especially refined sugar. Um, you know, I, I have a cheat day or two where I'll have a, a, a yummy treat, but um, those are exceptions to the rule. I am going, I'm doing cardio uh, of multiple varieties of them multiple times a week and I'm lifting weights as well. Um, yeah, so I, I'm just making those kinds of healthy choices and uh, yeah, like I said, the results are I've lost 30 pounds almost and I probably more, lost more than that in fat because as I said, I've put on muscle as well. Uh, that having been said, I would appreciate your prayers because I'm going to be having a, a an appointment soon with a neurologist because some of you might remember that several weeks ago, early, early on in Rethinking Hell Live, I had a nerve injury and I thought that it would recover. I thought it was just a pinched nerve, but as it turns out, it hasn't yet um, healed and my nerve damage in my arm especially has made it so that I can bench press less than half of what I used to be able to do. So in competition, I could uh, bench press over 340 pounds. Um, at the gym, just, you know, I could do a full set of 10 at 225 pounds, which for those of you who don't know is the Olympic weight bar with 245 pound plates on either end of the bar. Um, now I, I struggle to do a full set of even one 45 pound weight at each end of the bar. So my bench press has radically suffered and I would, I'm hoping the neurologist will be able to help me with that and would appreciate your prayers. Um, let's see here. Um, uh, Frank, thanks for being a big fan. I appreciate it, but don't be a big fan of me. I'm, I'm, I'm a really pretty piss poor person uh, in some ways and I'm thankful for God's grace if, if, uh, be a fan of Rethinking Hell if you want I think we're a really good ministry precisely because we're able to sharpen one another and make up for one another's weaknesses but yeah don't don't elevate me um let's see sugar is the end okay so now I think I'm toward the end of the comments because now people are talking about my comments about sugar and stuff so Ben congratulations on having lost 20, 20 pounds by doing the Mediterranean diet uh, Susan you said drink seltzer water instead no seltzer water is gross I hate it um, I'd rather just drink some a, a little bit of diet pop in the day and for the most part drink regular water and yeah, it can. I think the diet soda can make you gain weight, but obviously it doesn't have to because I've lost so much weight even while still drinking it. So that's pretty much all I've got. Um, you know, if, if any of you have any more uh, comments, questions, feedback, anything like that, or let's say that you see something, some article or some video or some podcast episode or something in which Believers in Eternal Torment... Um, or for that matter, believers in universalism argue uh, against our view, send me an email at live at rethinkinghell.com uh, and we will uh, be keeping an eye on that inbox so that we can respond to the things that you think are most valuable and cover the topics that you find most valuable. Um, ben, you said, did I see your comment about Hellfire? You'd have to say which one. I thought I, thought I did... Uh, oh, you said it's called Hellfire because Gehenna is also called Topheth, and Topheth is described in Isaiah as a place where fire has been prepared from long ago. Are you sure it's Isaiah, or, or do you maybe have in mind Jeremiah? Um, here's Jeremiah 7. Uh... Uh, to burn their sons and daughters in the fire. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when it will no longer be called Topheth or the Valley of Son of, Son of Hinnom, but the Valley of Slaughter. Uh, okay, you're right. This isn't the place, but there is maybe it is in Isaiah where it's where it's uh, likened to a funeral pyre. 
Yeah, you're right. Good call, Ben. Isaiah 30. Uh, and then this is, this is all the more reason for seeing Gehenna as a place where fire brings about death. Look what he says, beginning in, in verse 33 of Isaiah 30. Well, it is verse 33, not beginning there. A burning place has long been prepared indeed for the king. It is made ready. It's pyre. Pyre, by the way, is, is one of those like piles of wood and combustibles upon which you burn a corpse. All right. It's pyre made deep and wide with fire and wood in abundance. The breath of the Lord, like a stream of sulfur, kindles it. There's that sulfur again. Again, this imagery all throughout the uh, Bible and including the book of Revelation w that connects f sulfuric fire to hell is all language communicating death, not immortality and life forever in eternal torment. Um, so... I'm going to stop here or else I'll just keep responding to comments. Just email me at live at rethinkinghell.com if you want me to cover anything, if you want me to consider anything, respond to objections, answer questions, anything like that. And again, if you've enjoyed today's episode, please do click the like button and uh, like the video. Please also do subscribe to the channel. Um... Oh, okay. Maybe there is one more comment worth referring to. Oh, Star made a comment. I have one question. How many... <laughs> Star is my wife, by the way, and uh, she likes to watch... For some reason, she can't get enough of me, I guess, and she wants to watch me on YouTube, too. She says, how are you able to remember so many scripture verses off the top of your head, but you can't remember something your wife tells you from one hour to the next? Because I practice. I mean, because I'm doing this all the time, right? Because I'm so often doing debates and, and YouTube videos and stuff like that. Uh, so... Uh, that's that's why. But yeah, thanks, Star, for revealing to the world that I've got a terrible memory when it comes to our interpersonal interactions. Um, but no, in all seriousness, this is a weakness of mine. I and and Star knows this. I've, I she she knows this about me, and so do others. I've got a real problem in that I can't be fully in the moment mentally, because no matter what I'm doing, no matter where I'm at. In, in my mind, part of me is uh, thinking about this or that theological topic or whatever. I'm, I'm not saying it's a good thing. I'm just saying it's difficult for me to be in the moment. And so sometimes, very often, actually, whether it's my wife or anybody else, um, I'm not fully absorbing what they're saying because I'm not fully there. I'm not fully mentally there. And, and that's something I really need to work on. Just just being transparent to you guys. Um but anyway, Violinist Jeff, this is the last, these are the last comments I'm going to respond to. He says, Revelation 20 says Satan is tormented forever and ever, but Ezekiel 28, 18 and 19 says he gets annihilated. Um, how do we resolve this apparent contradiction? Easily. Revelation is imagery. It's, it's, it's uh, symbolic imagery. And this picture, this picture of, of these beings being tormented forever and ever in the lake of fire is interpreted by uh, an angel for John as, or sorry, by John himself and even God himself in Revelation 21.8 as communicating the second death, as representing the second death. That's why death and Hades are thrown into the lake of fire. You know, the very next chapter, God says from the throne, Hathanatas ukestai eti, death shall be no more. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 that the last enemy to be destroyed is death. Death and Hades being thrown the lake of fire signifies their annihilation in reality um the 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 background to this vision is daniel daniel's vision of the beasts in daniel 7 i believe it is in which the beast's fiery fate in the fire is explicitly interpreted as symbolizing the annihilation of a kingdom uh, the kingdom's reign or its dominion so so the way to reconcile this is that in the imagery satan is tormented forever and ever in the lake of fire just as the beast and the false prophet are and death and hades and the human beings but what all of this signifies in reality is destruction rather than immortality and eternal life thanks star for saying you're my biggest fan i, I appreciate that i need at least one um but then i think viol uh, violinist jeff no somebody else robert hines says does not jeremiah 31 40 relate to the restoration of gehenna and this i'm a little confused about through jeremiah 31 40 um I'll share my screen just so people can hold me accountable. The whole valley of the dead bodies and the ashes and all the fields as far as the brook Kidron to the corner of the horse gate toward the east shall be sacred to the Lord. It shall not be plucked up or overthrown forever. Yeah, I mean, that's interesting. I'm, I'm not sure what your point is with that, Robert. Uh, what I would say is if indeed this does talk about some sort of future restoration of the valley of the sons of Hinnom, I would think it makes perfect sense to say that's what happens after the wicked are finally destroyed there, right? We, we conditionalists don't typically think that the dead bodies of the wicked are going to form an everlasting pile, you know, some sort of memorial. Uh, we think that they will either be burned up to, to ash or they'll deteriorate and decay like corpses do or whatever. But either way, once that 
once God has dealt death to those who deserve it in that way and their corpses are, are destroyed, then like the rest of all of God's cosmos, uh, Gehenna, the Valley of the Sons of Hinnom, would be restored. So uh, it seems to me to be perfectly consistent with the overview. Again, I could keep going on, on and on and on. I, I won't. I will say one last thing, though. Um, last week, if you were here, you know that I responded to some comments about hell by James White, uh, somebody of whom I'm a big fan. Unfortunately, there's been no talk from him on Twitter or anyone else um, about that video. Uh... Unfortunately, it doesn't look like he's going to watch it and respond. Be praying, though. Um, some people on Twitter have already mentioned that they'd love to see a debate between us. And those of you who've been familiar with me and my ministry for a long time know that I very much want to debate him because I hold him in such high esteem. And so maybe if enough of us uh, continue asking him to debate me, maybe he will. I don't know. We'll see. But... Um, if you haven't watched it, go check out that last episode. I think it was a good one. And uh, otherwise, be back here next Monday, the second day of March 2020 at 6 p.m. Pacific time for the next episode of Rethinking Hell Live, which as usual, I will announce the theme of or the topic of on Facebook beforehand so you know what we're going to be covering. Uh, and until then, I hope that you uh, are uh, blessed by the Lord and that you... Um, learn to love God and your neighbor better and better uh, every day. And uh, I'll look forward to seeing you next time. Thanks so much for joining me. I'll see you then. Man, oh, look, maybe we should rethink this whole thing. I mean, I mean, you heard the guy. The pains of eternal torment. Yeah, I got to rethink this whole thing.